probably do as well around the country. Like, what are you hearing? What do you feel? You know, what do you see out there? What's the appetite for anything <clears throat> by way of uh, talking about new products, especially if they could potentially help with the situation? And it's a mixed message that I'm hearing. I'm, I'm seeing some tweets from superintendents with explicit messages, do not contact me. If we need anything, we will call you. <laughs> and then I'm hearing other things, which is, uh, well, they've got a little more time on their hands than they would have normally because the schools are shut down. There's not that, that general interruptive cl uh, climate right now. Um, they may have a little bit of money because they were not paying for cafeterias and uh, cafeteria workers and bus drivers and that sort of thing. And they may be getting some federal dollars. So um, I, I'm starting just uh, mid to late May to start up a drip campaign, an email marketing campaign that is, you know, soft sell, but um, that's my approach for now until the end of June. And I see my time is up. So I look forward to hearing from the rest of you. Sure. Kidblog, uh, in my not so humble opinion, is the best place for students to publish writing online uh, in a digital classroom setting. So, um, you know, for us, the silver lining in a lot of this was what many teachers may have viewed as a nice to have in the context of the traditional classroom day during this time has kind of suddenly become much more need to have in terms of some place for students to congregate um, in a digital, virtual, connected space that wasn't necessarily live Zoom video chats. Um, and uh, it's not so much that we're uh, capitalizing uh, aggress too, too cynically, opportunistically on that. It's just sort of been the reality of it. And so, you know, in a good way, one of our challenges has just been to make sure that we've um, struck the right tone with people coming to us looking for uh, you know our our features and functionality for their classroom uh, and and frankly you know mid-march when a lot of this stuff started down these dominoes started falling as angie said um, we were dealing with a lot of questions like you know uh, so do we get this free because because coronavirus um, and our answer was I guess, thankfully, consistent with what it had always been, which is we've had a 30 day free trial for the last six years. <laughs> so uh, it's always been free for that. And if you get to the end of that and you email us and let us know, we'll we'll be happy to work with you to extend that to make sure you've got what you need. But um, uh, at the same time, you know, finding a way to make sure that we were not just giving away uh, free accounts to anyone just because they showed up at our doorstep. Because um, what we found was uh, that influx of new users was actually uh, there was some prioritization that had to happen on the you know customer success and support side, and so um, just being able to prioritize folks that are kind of going through our standard onboarding flow versus changing the rules or changing the game had uh, it, it helped us make sure we continue to deliver value and service to the the customers that had either already paid us or were starting to pay for a subscription, um, you know, because of this. And frankly, our subscription price point in the grand scheme of things is pretty modest. So, you know, every dollar counts, but um, it's still a pretty good, pretty darn good value for our, for our classroom. Um, and uh, uh, so that's sort of the, both there's a challenge and opportunity there, obviously. Um, and I think just on the, the personal or kind of personal slash professional side, of course, when you're working out of a home office or the, the guest room or something, uh, personal and professional clash pretty pretty quickly. Um, and so it's just given us a chance to rethink some of our assumptions or habits or default routines that we get into. And, you know, even me just commuting up the street to uptown from uh, prestigious West Richfield where I live, um, you know, just sort of like a, like a robot every morning at eight in the morning, you know, get in the car and drive up, drive up around Lake Harriet and park and walk into WeWork and do your thing. And um, it's just been nice to be forced to rethink some of that and to be able to spend, frankly, a little more time with family. I have an 18 month old at home and it's been a interesting uh, time to just sort of see him throughout the day uh, more uh, as well, which has been a 
you don't get to do if you're sort of out and about all day every day so it's probably a standard theme for a lot of people but that's kind of how i'm feeling Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, likewise, appreciate Ed North for putting this on. It is, it's awesome to get together with everybody in a, in a virtual capacity and see you guys and, and hear from you as well. And I think, uh, like Angie said, I think, you know, uh, beyond the panel, I think there's a lot we can glean from each other here. So uh, excited for the breakout sessions, um, you know, here in a little bit. But for me, you know, uh, our company, we sell primarily device hardware to schools. Um, so a lot of Chromebooks, we sell nationwide. Uh, we're a hardware first company. We also do have a SaaS offering as well, a free asset management tool <clears throat> that we provide to school districts to allow them to manage the devices that we provide to them. Um, so we also do have a software aspect and a service aspect to our company as well. Uh, for me, I've been selling um, hardware to schools for uh, more than a decade, and, and thankfully, I've had the opportunity to go through one major epic shift, uh, EPOCH epic. Uh, a couple years ago, school districts went from desktops in, in the back of every classroom, uh, desktop you know, labs, to all mobile. It seemed overnight. This was end of 2014, early 2015. And one thing that I learned coming out of that, you know, being a, at that time, a desktop uh, provider to school district was that when there's a major change happening, a big shift in the market, there's a ton of opportunity. And so uh, certainly this time has been challenging. It, it, you know, I think we all agree. It kind of came out of the blue. Everything shifted seemingly overnight. And, you know, as Angie mentioned, it was like all these trade shows got canceled. Um, thankfully, getting a lot of money back and uh, could then reinvest some of those marketing dollars for us. Um, you know, one of the big shifts that we had to make was gathering brand new leads. And a lot of those came from trade shows. So, you know, us for our company, we're being, you know, we're two years old. When we go to a trade show, we're sort of the bells of the ball. We give away a bunch of free products. Um, we're, we're usually a pretty big hit at trade shows. And so not being able to do that, we had to get creative in how we were going out and gathering new leads. And so, you know, one of the opportunities in that was that we, we hired uh, a new marketing specialist. She came on board, um, mid March, uh, doing a phenomenal job, starting to, to really bolster our social media presence, um, kind of helping us round out our marketing in a lot of different areas, um, social media being one of them. It's one of our new emphasis that we've had. And in a, in a niche market, I think, you know, being creative in social media uh, is, is sort of a need. So bringing in a specialist to help us with that. Uh, but then doubling down on a, a drip email campaign um, as well. We, we use a platform called outreach.io. Um, you know, I had a, a couple of new sales reps that we had brought on just a couple months ago, and we added this new platform. We did a lot of trainings, really were able to kind of slow down. What, what happened was when the pandemic first hit, we sold out of all of our products, you know, so it was great for sales early on. We sold out of everything, and now there's been some supply constraints, but it's been a, a good opportunity for us as a team to kind of slow down, uh, shore up all the, uh, all the areas of our business that we need to to get ready for what we anticipate to be a, still a big summer uh, supply on, on the hardware side should be coming in here in the next couple of months. That's what we're hearing from all the major manufacturers and we're feeling good on that front. So we're still in, expecting another influx of business here in a couple of months. However, just slowing down right now and really shoring up all the details, a drip email campaign being one of them. And, um, and we're seeing tremendous success over email. And so, um, kind of going back and just, like I said, doubling down on that, we're, we're liking the uh, sort of new flow of leads is kind of a new avenue for us. Um, you know, as, as Angie mentioned, like there's a little bit of a mixed results. Some people are just, they don't have the time, um, don't prefer to be contacted. Uh, but overall we're finding that there's a, a greater percentage of our customer base or our prospect base. Uh, actually just having more time and they're open to hearing more. Um, some places are, some schools are shutting down early. So, you know, uh, for some of the administrators that we're talking to, we interface primarily with the tech directors is our decision maker that we're pursuing. Um, they have a little bit more time to check out the, the new and upcoming 
uh, of vendors, right? Um, we, we've also taken the opportunity in this time <clears throat> to come out with a couple new products. We've augmented our SaaS offering. Um, we, we've recently just secured a big service contract with uh, one of the largest school districts in Illinois because of uh, an immediate change that we made to our software offering. Um, and so that was obviously a huge boon and something that's going to help us in the long term. And it was all as a result of the current pandemic. And then we're also in the process of patenting a new um, hardware offering. Same thing, just to address some, some new needs that we're seeing arise in school districts. So, you know, overall, certainly lots of challenges, uh, lots of sort of chaos swirling about. But, you know, I think, I think um, everybody here on this call, everybody having an entrepreneurial type spirit, I just want to, you know, encourage you guys to keep exercising those entrepreneurial muscles uh, to go out and find that opportunity in the midst of all the change. I think there's a lot of opportunity here. Thank you. That's yeah, so um, quickly, um, City Life is a, uh, is a smart campus company. Uh, so we work on campuses. We have a platform that uh, helps students manage their everyday lives, whether it's real-time information on availability of the rec center or the library spots or wait time at food courts. It was how do we make their lives simpler as well as curate information and nudge them and, uh, and remind them to, you know, go to the gym, eat your food and all of that stuff. So it was more to focus on the non-academic success factors of, uh, of students. And uh, a second, uh, so we have, it's a, it's a smart campus platform. It's IoT and AI enabled. Uh, and we have three sub products, a, a app, a smart assistant app for the students. So all their life in one single app real-time, contextual, highly personalized. Second one was smart spaces. And I'm mentioning this because uh, I'm going to talk about this in a moment. And then we have the data analytics part, the smart decisions, uh, which is all for the school administrators to really understand what students are doing outside the classroom so they can target services and infrastructure and all of that stuff, investments, resources more accurately. Uh, come March, <laughs> like all of you know, uh, it was as if life came to a standstill. So suddenly, think, you know, and we're wondering, okay, what is going to happen now? Because just like Angie was saying earlier, we were on a roll. Uh, it was our peak selling season. We sell to higher ed colleges, um, and uh, everything was in place: uh, conferences and air tickets. Luckily, I had not paid for the exhibit <laughs> exhibits just yet, so. <laughs> Uh, somehow luck worked and I saved some money um, and, and, you know, some tears there. But anyway, so the, from March, middle of March to end of April, it was like, okay, what am I going to do? Will these schools ever reopen and how long will it take for them to reopen? And some of, couple of conversations we had uh, fixed with some student affairs folks uh, came up in April. And I was talking to this lady who is the VP of Cleveland State University uh, Student Affairs. And I asked her like, what are you struggling with right now? And she said, uh, we are a city-based school. Our kids have gone offline, but we want to bring them back. How do we keep the engagement, the spirit of the school online and on campus and you know, all of that stuff? And as I thought about that, and as I heard all these conversations, Going from Duke saying suspend our, our, our contract for the next two months, we don't know, we won't be able to use your services, can you suspend uh, Georgia Tech, Kennesaw, I mean, we had some good schools, all of them putting us on suspension, so the revenue drew, drew, uh, you know, kind of dried up. Uh, uh, with this conversation that I had, we have managed to find some sliver of hope in this so-called dark night that we're all going through with the flashlight looking for uh, pieces of hope somewhere, um, which is saying that our smart spaces solution, which was the IoT-based solution, which helped students uh, see a real-time availability and the administrators see what was the utilization of all the services across campus. Actually, we've pivoted that to say, we can actually help you open smartly and safely your campuses. And that's the biggest conversation happening in higher ed, at least today, that how, if we open, when do we open when it's, you know, 
with the CDC guidance and all of that stuff, but also how will we ensure that our students and staff are safe, we can manage crowds, we can maintain uh, social distancing and capacity. And that's exactly what our smart spaces solution does. So uh, we've pivoted, we've got a new prototype quickly built on paper. <laughs> And I have begun to call my friendlies and, uh, you know, the, the response in the last one week of actually starting to socialize this uh, has been very encouraging. And uh, I'm now uh, getting um, also interest from corporate campuses in other venues like Osborne 370. I'm a part of the Lunar Startup cohort this right now and they want to talk. So I think any large campus, it was always on our vision track is can we help them uh, figure this out, the safe reopening? And that's what I'm hoping we can take off. And then therefore, so we are beginning our very aggressive campaign. This is the next two months are the window of opportunity for us for doing this. So again, investing in um, some campaigns to reach out to our traditional, our, you know, the university segment very aggressively um, to senior leaders there, not people down the totem pole. And then also trying to open up the corporate campus a little bit and see if we have, we can find some legs there and building managers. So that's my story. And um, it overwhelms me because if I have the problem of saying too many calls and my phone is going off the hook, how will I scale quickly? But, you know, it's a good problem to have. So that's the path. I hope this helps. And home is great. So I want to take off on what Matt, you were saying. I have a 14 year old, a four year old dog. Um, my husband's working out of home. We're all on three different floors. So there's no cross <laughs> interference, but I have to feed them. So I plan my day <laughs> with hungry people coming. Uh, every time I hear the stairs go tuck, 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 I know it's time for somebody's hungry, <laughs> somebody wants food. So it's managing those. Uh, first off, just like the speakers before me, I just want to say thanks to Steve um, and Adam for putting this on. I remember going to my first Edge Accelerate event. This is years ago. I really went for the free food. Um, and I met Steve and the, the community was awesome. And so I'm really happy to be a part of this. Um, so Homie is in many ways building a new career center. And we like to think of ourselves as not traditional ed tech software. Um, and we're not building a career center solution that we're just selling to colleges. Uh, what we've really built is a hiring platform that creates true alumni engagement in frankly a time where everyone is grappling with the real value of college. And uh, we don't rely on integrating with college IT infrastructure. And really we go straight to the alumni. Um, and so it, it's, it's been an interesting journey uh, just with the company over the years. Um, when we first uh, when we first started the business, we, I walked into Carleton's career center. I went to Carleton College in Northfield, Minnesota. I walked into the career center and I said, I quote, uh, I don't think you guys do a very good job of helping students find jobs, which is just not something you want to tell higher ed. Um, and so we were pretty quickly blacklisted from Carleton's just list of tech we want to work with. Um, and, and that really set us on a very different path. Um, we realized that higher ed was very slow to sell into. We realized we needed to figure out a different model if we wanted to survive. And mostly just because we didn't have 18 months of runway. I mean, we were fresh out of college with 50 bucks in the bank of picking up 10K investor checks to stay alive. And so it, it, it forced us to be, to be nimble with the business. Um, and so what we did was, we, so an important thing to understand about higher ed software is that, at least mentorship software, is every piece, piece of mentorship software in our space uh, it's built around forums, Q&A forums where students are asking questions, alumni are answering those questions, a mentor-mentee relationships that are one-to-one. -one. And somewhere on the back end, there's a college administrator emailing both sides saying, hey, talk to this person, post these things so that we can drive engagement. And that's, that's just how higher ed works. And we were playing the game with the best of them, right? We had a great forum, Q&A, Carlton, uh, we had profiles, we had messaging, we had directories, we had all this stuff. And, uh, near the end of last year, we realized that we weren't solving a real problem. Uh, we were just putting another Band-Aid solution on another giant gaping hole in higher ed. And uh, we ended up axing our entire product. Uh, and it was, it was a tough move. You know, we'd spent four years building it. Uh, we'd been very, very vocal in the community about how you know, we thought our tech was the best. And you know, that's a story for a different time. But uh, we took a step back and we asked ourselves, what is, 
what is the best way to take all of this career wisdom that's in the heads of alumni and to share that at scale. And what we decided on was mobile video. And what we did was we made speaking on campus, this traditional act of going back to your alma mater and talking to students in the auditorium, we made it as easy as just FaceTime, right? You could just pick up your phone, answer questions students have uh, or other alumni have, and it would make it it would make it so that people could access that content no, anywhere at any time. And so we rolled out that product, that very, very bare bones video product last month. And within a week at Carleton College, we did 400 downloads, 2,500 video views, and the number of alumni volunteering to do more videos quadrupled. And so it's, a very, it's been a very unique time to throw out the product and it lined up uh, um, almost perfectly with the shutdown of schools. And so, uh, we've actually, so we brought on the former head of uh, Carlton's career center director, the guy who read my resume when I first got to college. Um, not the one I told that the career center sucks. The, the, he was gone by then. But um, so he's actually been heading up higher ed partnerships. Um, and it's been great because he just, he's been in career services for 20 years. He has a Rolodex of people he can just call on. And frankly, we've just realized I'm not the best person to put in front of higher ed because I say inflammatory things. Um, so that's that's been a very interesting experience just across the board. Um, and moving forward, I mean, as a as a career center, uh, a new a digital career center, uh, the goal should be hires, uh, and so it's an interesting metric to be tracking and trying to move towards when no one in the world is hiring, aside from a handful of what we call new normal companies. Uh, so right now, what we're doing is we're fo focusing on talent aggregation. We're building out the we're building out the student alumni piece of our marketplace. We're, we're giving the software for free to colleges, to anybody who wants to sign up for it. Um, and it's, it's essentially, it's, it's, a, it's all of your alumni networks on an app. Um, and, and so we're, we're testing all of those things. Uh, we expect that hiring will pick up again in the next six months when things become the new normal. Um, and, and so that's gonna be the plan moving forward. Um, we'll see how the career fairs go in, in the fall. That's going to be a big indicator of how colleges react to new software. But right now, it seems like there's quite a bit of appetite from higher, higher ed specifically because they're facing a, a crisis point. Of, is college worth it? And should I go to college in the fall? Uh, so crazy times. Um, let's update from our end.